This is Jason Anderson, and we are going to call this meeting to order. It is a regular town council meeting. Today is January 11th, 2021. It is currently 7.02 p.m. Um, Mr. Wood, would you lead us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we again uh, ask for wisdom and discernment in a, a servant's heart as well as we uh, discuss the business of this town. We pray this in your name. Amen. And we'll now do the Pledge of Allegiance. After the pledge, I ask that everyone stand for a moment of silence for Mr. Josh Kizik and Mr. Wood, if you would like to say something at that point. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, for those who may not know, uh, Joshua Cusack was uh, my colleague, uh, one of the paramedics here in town, uh, who recently passed away last Monday. Uh, and uh, as I was asked yesterday to say a few words there, I've been uh, asked multiple times over this past week to say a few words. And uh, the only words I keep coming back to, four, four simple words, I've lost my friend. Uh, Josh was a great co-worker, a fantastic supervisor, and a good friend. Uh, we worked side by side together as supervisors and shared many laughs as friends. We both worked hard for our people and <coughs> cared deeply for them. I recall when, he had, when I had COVID, uh, he would text me daily. And then about a month later, he caught COVID. And so I re returned the kindness. He was my go-to guy for many different things, and yet, we both had something to offer each other, uh, not just in EMS, but as life, in life as well. Uh, whether he'd like to admit it or not, in many ways, Josh was a politician. Uh, he would always uh, love to take in, call people. You'd he see him uh, discussing things with different organizations. Uh, much as he'd make fun of me for being the politician, he was just about the same. <laughs> But this is just a glimpse of who Josh was and our relationship with each other uh, and our people. I think of one uh, memory that I was asked to share that was funny. And uh, one of them was when both of us were working together doing our last standby together at the Thompson Speedway. Uh, it got chilly out and Josh wanted a sweater and we went to the gift shop and uh, <clears throat> Josh was saying, you think we should, can wear this? Because it doesn't say KB and it doesn't take and have paramedic on it. And I looked at him, I said, Josh, maybe we should consult a supervisor of the, about this. Of course, we had a good laugh there, and the poor cashier's looking at us, wondering why, and we had to explain to her that we're both supervisors. <laughs> As I reflect on this past week, though, I just want to say, on behalf of KB Ambulance and myself, we are absolutely humbled by the outpouring of support we have received from our community and beyond. Uh, we have always been there for this community in its time of need without thought or reservation. We have never thought we would be in time of need ourselves, but in that, we have been blessed by those who have offered condolences, words of comfort, and support. It means the world to us, and I want to say thank you. Uh, I've always been proud of our community here in Killingly, and this past week has given me even more reason to be proud of us in this great town, this northeast corner, our state, and beyond. I have to say that this is one great American family, and we belong that we belong to. We are all blessed to be united in service to one another, comforting one, each other, one another, and loving one, each other, loving one another. Uh, this is what makes America great, and our community reflects that very well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the ability to speak. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda is roll call for Roll call purposes, all council members are either in attendance live or logged in virtually. We have Mr. Whitehead and Ms. Wakefield are remote into this meeting. <clears throat> Next item up on the agenda is adoption of minutes of previous meetings. Can I get a motion to adopt the minutes 
for 5A Organizational Town Council Meeting December 6, 2021, and 5B Regular Town Council Meeting December 14, 2021. Patty George, I'll make that motion. Ray Wood, I'll second. Motion has been made by Ms. George, seconded by Mr. Wood. Is there discussion or corrections on these minutes? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I found a few errors, I believe. On the organizational meeting, uh, and on item three, the very last sentence, it says on the voice vote, Mr. Anderson was, was unanimously voted town council vice chairman. I believe we, so that needs to be corrected. And Further along on number six, when a consideration and action on a resolution establishing the place and date time of the meetings, it has year 2020 and 2021. I believe that should be 2021-2022. Or is that actually that's going to be 2022-2023? And then on that same item, Mr. Grandowski made the motion and it was seconded by Mr. LaPrade. Mr. LaPrade was not in attendance at that meeting. And one more for the adjournment. Mr. Grandowski made the motion to adjourn and Mr. Lee seconded it. So <laughs> Mr. Lee wasn't here either. I wonder what? if that was somehow carried over, um, copy and paste uh, from right. two years ago from the 2019 yeah. uh, organizational meeting. Um, do we want to I can let look you know that to look who did that right now so we can make I have an it. amendment? Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So for adjournment, the um, on the organizational meeting, Kevin Kurtula made the motion, Ed Grandowski seconded the motion. Um, oh. And then, um, what was your first correction? The very first correction was uh, item three on the voice vote. Mr. Anderson was unanimously voted as the town council chairman. I think he made the motion for it. And, uh, um, I have Mr. Wood made the motion. It's the last sentence on item uh, mm -hmm. three. Top of page 500. Yep. Okay. Um, that's got to be you, Kevin Gratula. Mm -hmm. Okay. Elizabeth, I can go over those with you after the meeting. And also top of page 501. Yep. I have those two dates. Um, not just the two oh. dates, but below it, it's Mr. Grandelsky and Mr. LaPrade on that one. Oh, yep. And that would be for appointing the secretary, and the appointment of the secretary was motion made by Ed Grandowski, seconded by Tammy Wakefield. <clears throat> Any further discussion or corrections? Mr. Whitehead or Ms. Wakefield, do you have any comments on this? No. No. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of adopting the minutes as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on on the agenda to presentations, proclamations, and declarations. Um, 6A, Mr. Lee is not in attendance. 6B. We um, didn't amend an agenda. No, I'm going off the, there. Oh. Okay, 6A is Killingly School Choice Week Proclamation. Whereas all children in Killingly should have access to the highest quality education possible, and whereas Killingly recognizes the important role that an effective education plays in preparing all students in Killingly 
to be successful adults. And whereas quality education is critically important to the economic vitality of Killingly, and whereas Killingly is home to a multitude of high quality public and non-public schools from which parents can choose for their children, in addition to families who educate their children in the home. And whereas educational variety not only helps to diversify our economy, but also enhances the vibrancy of our community. And whereas Killingly has many high quality teaching professionals and all types of school settings who are committed to educating our children. And whereas School Choice Week is celebrated across the country by millions of students, parents, educators, schools, and organizations to raise awareness of the need for effective education options. Now therefore, the Killingly Town Council does hereby recognize January 23rd to January 29th, 2022 as Killingly School Choice Week. And we call this observance to the attention of all our citizens. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 11th day of January 2022. Next item up on the agenda is item 6B, Killingly Teacher, the Teacher of the Year presentation to Mike Morrill. And I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, this is proclamation honoring Mike Morrill, Killingly Public School 2022 Teacher of the Year, whereas Michael Morrill has been an educator with the Killingly Public Schools since 2015. He joined Pil Killingly Public Schools as a long-term substitute, which was the beginning of his second career. Michael comes with years of education and experience that allows his positive influences and leadership to promote his students' success. And whereas, in addition to Michael's responsibilities in the classroom, he coaches girls basketball, advisor to the Technology Student Association, and most recently serves as the KIS Student Government and National Junior Honor Society advisor. He advocates for his students to take leadership roles and develop relationships with their peers that are positive and supportive. And whereas Michael identified a need during the pandemic and shifted quickly to facilitating meetings with KIS staff for social emotional learning, SEL, to meet the needs of students. It was instrumental in organizing and providing SEL professional developments to KIS staff through the year. Whereas Michael has volunteered boundless hours to renovate and expand outdoor classrooms and trails at Killingly Intermediate School to an oasis that is respected, admired, and enjoyed by the entire school. The outdoor classroom offers the students the ability to be interactive, makes a connection to nature, and offers a hands-on learning approach. They can collect data and learn about the deciduous trees and ecological issues. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly that Michael Morrill be publicly recognized for his exemplary service, extensive experience, and excellent teaching skills, and for the well-earned distinction and respect he has received from his students and peers as a 2022 Killingly Public School Teacher of the Year. And be it further proclaimed that he be commended for his devotion to his students, their families, the school, and the community, presented this 11th day of January 2022 by the Killingly Town Council. <coughs> Next item up on the agenda is item 6C, proclamation honoring Timothy Milton, Harvard H. Ellis Technical High School 2022 Teacher of the Year. Whereas Timothy Milton has been an educator for the last 10 years at H. H. Ellis Technical High School, as a graduate of Norwich Technical High School, Mr. Milton has brought skill and positive influences to H.H. Ellis Technical High School from his over 20 year career in the industrial field of precision manufacturing. And whereas in addition to Mr. Milton's duties as a teacher and his endless hours in his shop, 
He accepted the role of department head two years ago in the most challenging of years. His commitment and passion for students has never been brighter, including his success in turning his program from low enrollment to one of the most requested programs by students. Mr. Milton supported HHLS Tech Technical High School and QVCC in forming a strong partnership in the development of the QVCC Precision Manufacturing Program. And whereas Mr. Milton has taken his enthusiasm and positivity from the classroom to the basketball courts and the baseball field, coaching students for the last eight years with dedication, heart, and sportsmanship. He also volunteers for school communities and activities such as the senior prom. And whereas Mr. Milton's loyalty and his craft of teaching allows him to encourage and grow his students, building an environment where he not only creates opportunity, but is an ally to their dreams. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly that Timothy Milton be publicly recognized for his exemplary service, extensive experience, and excellent teaching skills, and for the well-earned distinction and respect he has received from his students and peers as the 2022 Harvard H. Ellis Technical High School Teacher of the Year, and be it further proclaimed that he be commended for his devotion to his students, their families, the school, and the community. Presented this 11th day, of January 2022 by the Killingly Town Council. Item 6D, Proclamation Honoring Lori Barrett, St. James School 2022 Teacher of the Year. Whereas Lori Barrett has served as a dedicated teacher at St. James School since 2002, and whereas Mrs. Barrett has served as a first grade teacher for the last seven years, she brings imagination, passion, and experience from her earlier <coughs> teaching years and creates a classroom full of excitement and structure. She utilizes her love of art to ignite her students and whereas Mrs. Barrett has taken her artistic talents and enthusiasm outside the classroom, offering art workshops, primetime reading nights, and spirituality retreats. She also supports her parish as a lector and enjoys quality time with her husband, children, and grandchildren. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly that Lori Barrett be publicly recognized for exemplary service, extensive experience, and excellent teaching skills and for the well-earned distinction and respect she has received from her students and peers as the 2022 St. James School Teacher of the Year. And be it further proclaimed that she be commended for her devotion to her students, their families, the school, and the community. Presented this 11th day of January 2022 by the Killingly Town Council. We'll now move on in the agenda, item seven, unfinished business for town meeting action, and I believe we have none. Moving on to item eight, citizen statement and petition. Pursuant to the town council's rules of procedure, article four, section two, all presentations by citizens shall be limited to an aggregate of 45 minutes, and each citizen's presentation shall not exceed five minutes unless otherwise indicated by a majority vote of the town council. Public comment can be emailed to public comment at killinglyct.gov or mailed to Town of Killingly, 172 Main Street, Killingly, Connecticut, 06239, on or before the meeting. All written public comment will be received prior, must be received prior to 2 p.m. the day of the meeting. 
Written public comment will be posted on the town's website, www.killingleyct.gov. Uh, Ms. Caloria, could you go over any submitted comments? Mary Caloria, town manager. There were seven uh, comments submitted through the email address. Uh, the first one is Lydia uh, Rivera Abrams from 45 Mason Hill Road in Dayville, and she is submitting comment in support of appointing um, Adam Reynolds to the Permanent Building Commission. The next one is Michael Huco, 20 John Street, Danielson, is submitted public comment in support of appointing Adam Reynolds to the Permanent Building Commission. Jessica Payette, uh, no address was listed, um, submitted comment in support of approving Adam Reynolds for the Permanent Building Commission. Jennifer Horner, no address was submitted, um, in, uh, submitted comment in support of Adam Reynolds to the Permanent Building Commission. Terry Barton, 655 Chestnut Hill Road in Dayville, submitted public comment in support of approving Adam Reynolds for the Permanent Building Commission. Jeremy Grethier submitted public comment, no address identified, um, and submitted public comment in uh, support of Adam Reynolds for the position on Permanent Building Commission. The last one was received from uh, Kathy Fedor of 107 Primrose Crossing in Dayville, and she submitted comments and questions with regards to the Killingly Public Library and the discussion uh, that was presented during manager's comments at last session, last meeting. That was all submitted written public comment. Uh, thank you. Um, to the public, um, I do encourage you, if you are submitting written comment, to please include your address as the council can then um, determine how much your opinion would be weighed in on certain items. Um, as we ask people when they come forward during public comment to speak, we ask them to state their name and address so that way the council members are aware to where, where the speaker's coming from. Um, also, I had received some feedback as to why we allowed certain people who lived out of town to speak during public comment period. Um, I looked through the town charter, I looked through the town council rules of procedure, and today I conferred with the town manager that uh, irregardless of where you live, you're allowed to speak during public comment period. And as I stated, we do ask what your name and address is, so we can take that into consideration as we are considering the comments that are made. Um, also, if you do submit public comment, written public comment, um, and you, do you can still come in person to speak, if you do, we just ask you to wait until all those who had not submitted written public comment speak first as we would in a situation where someone speaks and then they come up, they want to speak again after their time's allotted time, um, we ask them to wait as well until the rest of the public has had a chance to speak. At this time, we will open up for public comments. If there is anyone who has public comment, please step to the microphone at the podium, state your name and address. Lynn LaBurge, 2080 Franklin Street. Question I have is, I understand, you know, about the library fines and wanting to stop them, but what is going to be done if a book isn't returned at all? Will people still be billed for that book, or how will it be replaced? Is that going to come out of the town's pocketbook? Thank you very much. Is there any further public comment? Last call for public comment. Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is council and staff comments. Uh, Ms. Gloria, I know we had received a comment regarding the uh, Library fines issue, as was brought up again tonight. Um, can you just speak to what Ms. LaBerge just said? Sure. So I'll speak to what uh, Ms. LaBerge's comment is, as well as Mrs. Fedor's comments or questions. Um, we're still in the process of developing what the policy will be. 
So that policy, once developed, will be brought forward to the town council for the council to consider and receive comment on. So that will be brought, um, and I'm sure will be part. It's going to be part of a regular agenda item. Um, last month's discussion was really brought about by my comments um, and just making them aware of a article that was written recently in the Norwich Bulletin about um, a, an evaluation that was done more regionally, um, including some of the large cities like New York and Boston around whether or not libraries wanted to continue to utilize fines and fees uh, or, or uh, utilize the, fee, the fine structure um, and to let the council know that the town was the town staff was evaluating that. So we haven't determined or set any new policies. We haven't changed our existing policies as of yet. That will be hopefully brought to the town council, um, likely in their fiscal subcommittee, and then ultimately to the town council um, in the upcoming next couple of months before we hit budget season. And hopefully we'll have some more details on exactly what 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 steps is the town going to take should the material be completely, um, you know, unrecoverable from the individual um, versus uh, just late fine. So we are still working on that structure. Um, and I hope that that does answer some of the questions. Um, Mrs. Fedor had asked a few additional questions, which I can respond to her via email. Uh, thank you. I do have one quick question in her response to that. Um, seeing how the study, as you said, addressed, uh, looked at bigger cities and how they're handling the situation, um, my question would be, uh, the bigger cities that they studied, what percentage of their funding comes from private donation? What percentage comes from public funding? Um, just so we have kind of an apples to apples comparison, um, because if bigger cities are receiving a lot of private funding, um, is it always the best scenario to mimic what the bigger city is doing? And that's always a good, you know, an area that we want to evaluate. I will say that our public library does have private funding as well. Um, we have a num the, our public library is fortunate to have a number of trusts, and um, as of the last um, six or seven years, the bulk of all books are purchased through those trust funds and not purchased through operating funds. That got shifted a number of years ago. Um, but one of the trends, what they really look at is whether, not necessarily where the funding is, but um, the trends in how um, is fines, um, a deterrent for people or a way for our libraries to recover the material? Do people bring back the material in, a, in order to avoid getting fines or to stop late fees from accruing? Um, and what most of the um, towns and cities that have evaluated this have determined that the fine structure um, really doesn't stop people from being late. And it doesn't stop people that aren't going to bring the material back. They just don't bring it back. Um, so, and there are other, you know, different policies that others have put in place when, you know, a material is not returned to the library um, at all, and it becomes a willful neglect on the individual that has a library card, um, and how the library manages that. So, you know, we want to look at what those trends are. Um, clearly, you know, percentages of funding are going to be, you know, something that we look at as well. But um, know that our, so um, a lot of locally, um, many people may think that our library is 100% funded straight by general government operating funds, and that's not the case. There, there is trust fund um, funding that the, that the library does, does utilize on an annual basis. All right, thank you very much. Any other comments? Ms. Wakefield or Mr. Whitehead? Any comments from either of you? Yes, I'd like to reach out to Mrs. Fedor. Um, if she would like to contact me, she did mention me in her comment. I wouldn't mind discussing that further with her because I spent some time today in reading some of the articles <clears throat> online and uh, I would definitely like to just expound on that with her if she, if she wants to. She, and I'm sure my contact information is on the website. She can call me anytime. But I do have some questions for her, and uh, I'd imagine she has some questions for me. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Fedor, if, she, if you're watching online or listening to this, um, the all our town council members, our contact phone numbers um, are on the town's website as well as our email addresses. 
and that goes for any members of the public. If you want to reach out to your council members, um, you do have the oppor opportunity two different ways. Um, you can reach us via email. You can also uh, reach us through phone. Ms. Wakefield, did you have any comments? No, not at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no further comments, we'll move on in the agenda. The next item up is reports from liaisons, or excuse me, no, uh, appointments to boards and commissions. Oh, yeah, trying to get it over. <laughs> uh, item 10A, uh, Brian Card is seeking reappointment to the Planning and Zoning Commission as a regular member. The term would run from January 2022 to December of 2024, a three-year term. Mr. Card has been a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission as a regular member since 2008, and prior to that, an alternate member for two years. His attendance has been steady over the course of his appointment. The Planning and Zoning Commission is a commission with five regular members and three alternate members, including Mr. Card. All five regular member seats are filled. There are three alternate member vacancies available. Would someone like to make a motion to reappoint Mr. Card to the Planning and Zoning Commission? Ray Wood, I'll make that motion. Patty George, I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Mrs. George. I will open up for discussion. I will say in the, the Planning and Zoning meetings I've been to, Brian is always very involved, um, very thorough, and very knowledgeable. Um, he does a phenomenal job on the Planning and Zoning Commission, and I can say without a doubt he is definitely an asset to this community, and I would fully endorse uh, his reappointment as a regular member. Mr. Grandelsky. I concur with your comments. Thank you. Ms. Barclay. I'm the new liaison to the Planning and Zoning. I've attended two meetings, and I agree with continuity. Um, Planning and zoning is very time consuming and these individuals are very knowledgeable of all the laws and it's um, a lot of work so I also support him. Thank you. Any comments from Ms. Wakefield or Mr. Whitehead? No. Not at this time. Seeing no further comments, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on to item 10B. If I may, Mr. Anderson. Yes. There's a correction to the agenda for item 10B. Um, Verga is looking for reappointment to the Planning and Zoning Commission. That is an error. It was a typographical error. So they rear the the background, uh, the backup documents all reflected appropriately with Planning and Zoning Commission. It's just written wrong on the agenda. My apologies for that error. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Virgil Lorenz is seeking reappointment to the Planning and Zoning Commission as a regular member. The term will run from January 2022 through December 2024, a three-year term. Ms. Lorenz has been a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission as a regular member for many years. She was a member for over a decade in the 80s and 90s and came back to the Commission in 2015. Her attendance has been steady over the course of her appointment. The Planning and Zoning Commission is a commission with five regular members and three alternate members, including Ms. Lorenz. All five regular member seats are filled. There are three alternate member vacancies available. Uh, can I get a motion to reappoint uh, Ms. Lorenz? I'll make a motion to I'll second that. Motion has been made by Mr. Catula, seconded by Ms. Barclay. Uh, I, I will open up for comments. Um, I will say very similar to Brian Card when I've been at the planning and zoning meetings. Um, Virga does a phenomenal job. Um, one of the things that I've really been impressed with is how dedicated she is to make sure um, that all the applicants abide by lighting rules and, and dark sky regulations um, to help protect uh, against light pollution. It's not something you hear about a lot, um, but as I stated during her interview last week, coming from someone who loves looking at the sky in astronomy and astronomy and now recently astrophotography, I've started looking at, looking at and um, definitely does a phenomenal job when she's on there and uh, appreciate the dedication she has to the community. 
Any comments from Ms. Barclay? I also agree with your comments and she's looking out for the best interests of the town and growth and also um, in maintaining the beauty of the town. Mr. Wood? I have to say that is one thing I'm impressed with there. You know, I grew up in South Killingly and we don't have all the things that we have here in the borough um, with uh, lighting and stuff like that. So it was always nice to be able to go home and be able to look up and actually see the skylight, the sky and everything like that. And, um, it's actually nice to have a, a member. Uh, I mean, all these guys do a phenomenal job, but uh, it's nice to have a member who thinks about these things there and um, you know keeps that in everybody's forefront in their mind as well. So uh, I'm definitely impressed with that. Thank you. Um, one, uh, Mr. Grandelski, please. Yeah, I think she's uh, you know, she's in there. Uh, she's well familiarized with all the rules, the regulations, and whatnot. And uh, she takes everything seriously. And she's working out for the best interest of the town. Good for you. Thank you. Um, I would just like to add. The fact I live as close as I do to the industrial park and at nighttime I can still look out and see the stars um, says a lot to the fact that planning and zoning has definitely made applicants adhere to regulations and guidelines. Any further comments? Anything from Ms. Wakefield or Mr. Whitehead? No, sir. Thank you. No. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? abstentions motion carries unanimously we'll now move on in the agenda the next item up is 10 C Byron Martin is seeking reappointment to the Agriculture Commission as a regular member the term would run from November 2021 through October 2024 a three-year term Mr. Martin has been a member of the Agricultural Commission as a regular member since November 2012. His attendance has been steady over the course of his appointment. The Agriculture Commission is a commission with five regular members and three alternate members, including Mr. Martin. Four regular member seats are filled. There is one regular member and one alternate member vacancy available. Can I get a motion to reappoint Mr. Martin? Ray Wood, I'll make the motion. Patty Georgia. Uh, motion was made by Mr. Woods, seconded by Mr. Grandalski. Um, I will open up for comments. Um, I like what he does with the um, the B classes that he has. It's uh, it, he does a lot of work to put those together, and he has a very good turnout for those. And I, uh, I commend him for that. And I'd like to see him keep doing that if it's possible. Thank you, Mr. Grandalski. Well, as he said during his interview. He has a unique business over there, it's, uh, you know, and to take the time out from that and put, you know, come into here, you know, take on the, the, the B class and everything else, I, I got to commend everybody for that. All, all of these people are really doing a wonderful job. So I, I, I am looking, I approve his reappointment. Thank you. Any further comments? Mrs. George? Um, being the ag liaison for the two years working with Byron, like Ed said, as busy as he is with Logies, he puts his all into ag. He's always looking to try and grow it, bring in new members, and he does a really good job. Thank you. Any comments from Ms. Wakefield or Mr. Whitehead? No, sir. No. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, all those in favor of reappointing Mr. Martin say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on in the agenda to item 10D. Patrick McLaughlin is seeking appointment to the Water Pollution Control Authority as a regular member. The term would run from November 2021 through October 2000, 2024, a three-year term. Mr. McLaughlin has been a member of the Water Pollution Control Authority as a regular member since January 2024. Mr. McLaughlin's attendance. Or, ah, we have an error in here. Okay. That was 
inhale it. Okay, in. that was. I was looking at the 24 before that. Mr. McLaughlin has been a member of the Water Pollution Control Authority as a regular member since January 2004. Mr. McLaughlin's attendance has been steady over the course of his appointment. The Water Pollution Control Authority is an authority with five regular members and two alternate members. Currently, there are three active regular members, including Mr. McLaughlin. Two regular member and two alternate member seats are vacant. Can I get a motion to reappoint Mr. McLaughlin? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski, seconded by Mr. Wood. I will open up for comments. Mr. Grandelski. <laughs> Thank you. I agree. Um, the times I filled in as liaison to the WPCA um, and also times that I just sat in other times when you were there and I sat in on meetings, um, he, he always seemed to do a phenomenal job. Um, any further comments? Mr. Wood? And just kind of to echo a little bit of what you've said there, I believe if I remember right, he said that the whole, everything that they've just got through doing he started that process a long time ago, and uh, to see that through and dedicated, being de this dedicated to our town is very commendable and um, definitely can approve someone who has this kind of devotion to the town of Kellingly. Thank you. Any comments from Ms. Wakefield or Mr. Whitehead? No. Sir. Seeing no further comments, all those in favor of reappointing Mr. McLaughlin say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on to item 10E. Thomas Weaver is seeking reappointment to the Permanent Building Commission as a regular member. The term would run from December 15, 2021 through December 16, 2025, a four-year term. Mr. Weaver has been a member of the Permanent Building Commission since 1995. His attendance has been steady over the course of his 26 years on the commission. The Permanent Building Commission is a commission with five regular members and two alternate members. Currently, there are five active regular members, including Mr. Weaver, and two alternate member seat vacancies. Can I get a motion to appoint Mr. reappoint Mr. Weaver? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Catula, seconded by Mr. Grandelski. I will open up for comments. Mr. Catula? Being the liaison to that board and seeing how that board works and gets to along and with the experience that's on that board and uh, the way Mr. Weaver handles the meetings there, I'm more in favor of endorsing him for that back to that commission. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Grandelski. He's got a lot of experience, um, you know, continuity and whatnot. Uh, he's chair. Thank you. Any further comments? Ms. Wakefield or Mr. Whitehead, any comments? No, no. sir. Seeing none, all those in favor of reappointing Mr. Weaver say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Next item up on the agenda is 10F. Vance Carter is seeking appointment to the Board of Recreation as a regular member. There are currently two regular member vacancies with a term of two years in which both terms run from January 1st, 2022 through December 31st of 2023. Uh, Mr. Vance is interested in being appointed as a regular member of the Board of Rec. Can I get a motion to appoint Mr. Carter to the Board of Rec? Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski, seconded by Mr. Wood. I will open up for comments. Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Wakefield. So I, I think this candidate, along with the, the next one, which I'll speak, I can say when he gets up there, um, it's, 
the board of rec is a very active commission and it's it's good to see people that that have uh, decided you know i believe if i remember correctly they both had recently retired and have extra time um i think they're going to find that the um, recreation commission and the recreation department has a lot to offer and I, I think both of them have a lot of energy and I think they'll bring some new blood and new ideas to, to the rec department. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grandelsky. Yeah, I've talked to Vance from time to time, you know, um, looking, requesting him to look into various commissions and finally he put his name in and I had to applaud him for that and I saw him tonight and I said, well, you're going to be on our agenda tonight. So he said, well, he can't make it because he has to work. You know, in his interview the other day, you know, he was a runner and he was active, he was a coach, so yeah. he's, he's into this, and I, I think it's, it's going to be a good appointment. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments? <clears throat> Mr. Whitehead, any comments? No, sir. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, all those in favor of appointing Mr. Carter to the Board of Rec, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on to agenda item 10G, Kevin Mahan, appointment to the Board of Rec as a regular member. Again, there are currently two, there are currently one regular member vacancies since we just filled one. Uh, it has a term of two years and that will run from January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2023. Mr. Mahan is interested in being appointed as a regular member of the Board of Rec. Can I get a motion to appoint Mr. Mahan to the Board of Rec? I'll make that motion. Patty George, I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Catula, second by Mrs. George. Discussion. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, so, I, like I said previously, um, bo both of those um, candidates, when we interviewed them last week, they both had a lot of um, a lot of energy and a lot of great ideas, and and I look forward to because um, as the li liaison and having worked with the rec department for many years, even as even when I was in the liaison, um, I, I look forward to um, working with with some people that are going to bring some new energy and new life and new ideas and you know just help us to expand activities for the for the citizens in Killingly. Thank you. I agree. Is there any other further comment from council? <clears throat> Mr. Whitehead? No sir. Thank you. Seeing none, all those in favor of appointing Mr. Mahan to the Board of Rec say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on in the agenda. The next item up on the agenda is a item 10H, Adam Reynolds, seeking appointment to the Permanent Building Commission as an alternate member. There are currently two alternate member, member vacancies with a term of four years that would run from December 16th, 2020 through December 16th of 2024. Mr. Reynolds is interested in being appointed as an alternate member of the Permanent Building Commission. Can I get someone to make a motion to appoint Mr. Reynolds to the Permanent Building Commission? I'll make that motion. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky. Motion has been seconded by Mrs. Murphy. I will open up for discussion. Mr. Grandelsky. Well, as uh, being an electrician, um, I think you would bring a lot to the table. Um, you know, we need a different set of eyes. Uh, as was said, when the Permanent Building Commission members were on uh, a few months ago, they're getting older, and uh, they've been on it for a while, and someone would like to see some new blood come on, and I think you would be a good addition. Um, as far as the interview and the comments, the public comments, Last week, uh, there was a lot of comments about one particular small issue that the, um, the it was just one issue about uh, you know labor unions and, and projects in town. 
but the permit building commission is much more than that uh, they they have to take on the whole project and uh, I think uh, you know he, he made a comment that you know um, project labor agreements have to be worded in a way that is in the best interest of the town and I think when the union people came in they just looked at the point that he was totally against unions working in town and I don't think that is true Thank you. Is there any other further comment? Mr. Cattula. Um, I know Mr. Reynolds, some of his activities or actions at some of the meetings have been, been uh, a little out of line to Robert's Rules of Orders and how he uh, conducts himself at the meeting. To be put on one of these boards, I think it might give him some more experience and how and get a little more involved and then be able to see how things function and things how things go uh, but I don't know if I've ever seen anybody come in for an appointment that has had as much uh, interest or uh, public comment about <coughs> some for some against uh, so it's uh, it makes you wonder why there's so much of a I don't know, just a controversy but such interest in one way or the other uh, thank you Thank you. Is there any further comment? No, go ahead, Pat. You can go first. Ms. Murphy. Uh, I was just going to say that I really appreciate all the public comment. I really appreciate all the people that came. I really appreciate all the people that wrote me. Um, we don't always know everything that's going on there, and I think the communication is very important, and I welcome it, and I encourage people, please keep reaching out to us so that we can hear your input. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Mrs. George. Um, so we've gotten information <coughs> pro and con, and I think it's important to realize when you're serving the public, it's a humbling experience. I think it would be a good idea for him to serve on this commission because a lot of the, um, like walking out of a meeting like this, things like that, and not understand the difference between a regular and a special, you'll learn all those different nuances and working with a board that's so seasoned professional and experienced you'll learn more to listen than speak before you're actually aware of everything going on so I think it's a good idea to put him on a board it's an alternate position so he'll have time to learn the ins and outs thank you any further comments mr. wood I do agree. Everybody's everybody has a learning curve there. You know, we we all were new once. I know for uh, you, Michelle, and you, Andy, you're you're both new. You're still learning, and we're still learning too. And Mary's great at correcting us. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, th there's definitely a, a learning curve to be had. Um, just as, uh, I'm still kind of unfortunately, I, I I am still on the fence. I'm not against Mr. Reynolds by any means. Um, but uh, I think I've been given a lot to think about on both sides of it, which continues to leave me on the fence about everything. Um, so uh, nothing, nothing by any means personal against him there. It's just uh, I've had, I've heard good and bad, and kind of leaves me of where do I really need to look, uh, and I'm kind of in the middle, if you will. Thank you. Ms. Wakefield or Mr. Whitehead, do you have any comments? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Wood Whitehead. I believe if you want to be on <clears throat> one of these boards and commissions, you really have to have an open mind. And it's not about your feelings. It's about what's good for the town. And I think if you're, you're, you're Adam, I think you're just so strong against unions or PLAs I, th I think you can't you can't go into this with such a strong mind you have to have an open mind you have to see what's going to benefit the town completely and that that leaves me kind of wishwashy on this on this decision as well because you're so strong and 
set, I, I guess, set in your way about this project labor agreement. And I agree with Mr. Grandowski that, you know, that's, that's a small portion, but if that's, if that's parlayed through the rest of the, your decision-making that could, that could be a problem. Just my opinion. I think your energy level is fantastic, but I just, I, I believe you gotta, you, you have to step away from your personal feelings and you really have to, yeah, the town has to be the, the most important decision. Thank you. The, the town's interest, my apologies. Thank you. Ms. Wakefield? Uh, so, so I have to agree with a couple of the other comments. I believe Mr. Kutula had talked about um, how much experience is actually currently on the permanent um, building commission. Um, a lot of those um, individuals have been in the trades for, they probably won't, won't want to admit how many years they've been in the trades, but they're very experienced and they're very versed in how a meeting runs. Um, I, I agree with, with, uh, Ms. Lyro, um, in that um, the there's a learning learning there's an ability there's going to be a learning curve, but there's the fact that it's an alternate position. It's not a voting position unless they don't have a quorum, which currently they're you know they would have to lose a lot of members in order for them to need need that alternate to vote. So I think it would give him an oppor Mr. Reynolds an opportunity. Um, the fact that he's in the trades, he understands the trades. Um, I think that that's a plus for him and it would help qualify him to, to sit on this particular commission. Um, I, I think in years past, we've had a lot of candidates come forward that, that are very qualified and applying for, for boards and commissions and, and that relate back to what they do for their profession, which is a benefit for the town. Um, I will agree with Mr. Whitehead in that uh, Mr. Reynolds does have a lot of energy. I mean, I know he's involved with, with the with the scouts currently, and um, he's looking to get involved in town. Um, I think we should always try to encourage um, people to be involved because there, there are a lot of towns that, are, that have a lot more boards and commissions with a lot more empty spots than we have. Um, so I, I think this is a good, good place and it's a good fit. I think he's going to have a lot of good mentors that are already currently on that permanent building commission, um, that will help guide him in, in how meetings are run and, 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 you know, learning, learning how, how you have to have to stop and think sometimes before you you say or put anything in writing because it will come back and 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 people will call you on it um because um i've been stopped over the years in grocery stores by people for decisions the council's made um, might not have been the way i voted but it, they they stopped me anyways so um we live in a small town and everybody knows who you are and um and you're not always going to make everybody happy so um i think i think um the fact that he's willing to come forward and and put himself in a position to volunteer for the town is good um and i think the this particular position would be a good one for him to learn how, how meetings are run and and how the system works so that's what i think Thank you, Ms. Barclay. I agree with both sides of the comments, um, especially um, learning to be respectful of people that you're talking to. Thank you. Um, since everybody else has already commented, I have been reserving my comments for last. Um, one item I want to address was comments made by Ms. Wakefield as far as um, there would have to be a lot of members not show up to be an issue be a uh, opportunity if Mr. Reynolds is appointed for him to vote. Um, my conversation with Ms. Caloria last week and you can just verify 
back me up on this, I believe you said the last Permanent Building Commission meeting, they were barely able to uh, reach a quorum to be able to have the meeting. That happened at their meeting with regards to appointing the, um, or, or interviewing, I should say, the architects. Um, that doesn't happen at every meeting, um, but it, it does happen. And when you have an, a very active commission like the Permanent Building Commission and um, large capital projects that are underway that will probably need to meet more frequently than once a month, um, people's schedules sometimes conflict. And so it's possible that they would be, you know, um, uh, you know, having uh, a, a regular member absent or, or whatnot, but it has happened with that, as it's happened with many commissions. Sure. Just, I'd like to add one more. That was a Saturday morning meeting. Um, all the meetings that are during the scheduled meetings during the week, are, uh, they're always haven't had a problem with a quorum during the week. Thank you. Um, there are a few other things I want to touch on upon this. Um, we did hear a lot of pros and cons, um, people for, people against, Mr. Reynolds. Um, one, one concern I had, and it was the reason why I brought up the question last week and gave Mr. Reynolds the opportunity to explain his comments, were back in September, um, and, and I will quote his comments, are we, are we going to touch a PLA again? Were we going to basically cut the knees off of a good portion of people who can bid on a project? Then during his interview last week, he said, I'm not against PLAs, I'm all for PLAs. Um, for someone to go back and forth on positions on something like that does raise concerns to me. Um, I just wanted to give him the opportunity to clarify his comments last week, um, which is why I brought that question forward. Since then, there's been a lot of comments on social media that my asking him to clarify his comment was politically motivated on my part. I just want to clarify with 100% certainty that is not the fact. If I were to decide by my political position and be politically motivated on voting for boards and commissions, Two years ago, when someone ran directly against me, who was my opponent running for town council, when he came forward the month after I was sworn in again, applying for the Planning and Zoning Commission, why did, would I have voted for him and not against him if I'm making my decisions on appointments to boards and commissions based off political motivation? I. And I have never questioned Mr. Reynolds' ability and his expertise in the electrical field, nor will I ever. My concerns are based off of his actions. For those who don't know what has gone on, I will bring this out to the public's attention. Um, back in September, during a special town council meeting, um, I had opened up for public comment. Mr. Reynolds was walking up to the podium. I clarified with him that public comment at a special meeting is related to the, uh, the items on the agenda, and there was only one item on the agenda that night, which was the reappointment of a member to the Board of Rec. Mr. Reynolds still came up to the podium after my direction, after my guidance on the rules of procedure for that meeting, and still spoke to the community center project. After the meeting, I spoke with him and just let him know it wasn't that I didn't want to listen to what you had to say. It was a matter of we're following rules of procedure. During the meeting, I had also told him that he could come back the following week with his public comment to the regular town council meeting, which he did. However, after the meeting, Mr. Reynolds had posted on Facebook saying that, I, that the town council cut him off and did not allow him to speak. The next month, in October, the Town Council recognized October as National Bully, Preven Bully Prevention Month. Later on during that meeting, after Mr. Reynolds had already made public comment, when the meeting had moved on to council and staff comments, council members were speaking. In the middle of Mr. Reynolds' opponent for town council seat, 
She was speaking and Mr. Reynolds interrupted her outside of public comment period. Again, not following rules. My concerns aren't over his ability to, to his knowledge that could be valuable to this commission. My concerns are over his attitude and his actions and what seems to be an a unwillingness to follow rules and procedures. That kind of actions and attitudes, I feel there's no place for in a commission. That being said, I will address one other thing. Mr. Cotula had spoke that he couldn't remember any other candidate coming forward for a board of commission that created, in a sense, this much of a stir. I actually remember such time. It was 2018. I had recently been elected to the council for the first time. After a candidate interviewed for an alternate position on planning and zoning, I had three council members lobby me to vote against him. Not because of his qualifications, but because of what his positions were. And that they did not feel he was a fit for the commission. Of those three council members, one of them is still sitting with us right now, Mr. Grandelsky. That member of the community wanted to serve on a board and commission, planning and zoning. He actually interviewed twice. He interviewed in 2018. He also interviewed in 2020. 2020, he was appointed. Both times when he came up for appointment, Mr. Grandelsky wouldn't vote for him. So there is precedent where council members in the past have chose not to vote for someone for a board of commission, not because of experience, but because they feel they wouldn't be a good fit for the commission. That being said, I have nothing further. If anyone else would like to speak, Mr. Grandelsky. lobbied a council member. You may be have taken it wrong, but I've never lobbied. Maybe I could say in a conversation that I may not agree that you may know where I'm going and during our conversation, but I never specific lobbied any member of the council at any time. I'm very careful about that. And I do not like that type of a comment. I am offended. Mr. Grandelsky, I'm sorry you're offended, but your comment to me was, he's not a good fit. You would approach me after the meeting and said, he's not a good fit, as well as two other council members who were definitely more elaborate on why they felt he wasn't a good fit. but I remember it specifically because it was the only time up until that point anyone I'd ever heard of anyone taking a position against someone running for a commission. But I take offense at you saying that I lobbied you, which I did not. That's pushing the limit. That's way out there. So what you're saying, you know, specifically come to you which I didn't do, if I'm having a conversation with somebody, that is not lobbying a person. There's a difference. Maybe I expressed my concern early on. Okay, here's what's going on. Here's my feeling. I have a right to do that. But for someone to tell me that I lobbied them, no. Is there any further comment? Ms. Kind Murphy. Of, kind of a clarification question. Uh, with PLAs, non-union can bid on them. So that was a misunderstanding, right? Uh, union and non-union can bid in the PLA. 
It depends on how the PLA is written. Sometimes they're set aside within a PLA for non-union locals um, for them to also be able to bid. So it depends on the structure of the PLA. Who writes our PLAs? Is it the uh, commission? So in the um, KMS project, we have the PLA to be uh, written with approval by the Permanent Building Commission, but written by the um, construction manager at risk. Um, because they'll be the one that we uh, contracting with all of the vendors, with all of the subcontractors, um, and uh, the Permanent Building Commission will approve that. The Permanent Building Commission typically is the one that approves the uh, uh, structure of the PLA. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Abstain. So we have five for, two against, and two abstentions. Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. The next item up on the agenda is 11 reports from liaisons. 11A, Board of Ed liaison. Mr. Farron, if you could come forward, please. Hi, everybody. Hello, it's great to have a liaison from the Board of Ed. <laughs> Um, so as you can tell, I'm the new liaison for the, for the uh, town council from the Board of Ed. Um, I just had a few highlights from our last uh, BOE uh, meeting. Um, I'm, I'm, I didn't want to have this go too long. I don't, I'm trying to gear, you know, how long my comments should be so I don't take up too much of, of your meeting time, but I hit the highlights of uh, what's going on. Um, so we had uh, two members that did not run for re-election, and we have uh, two uh, new members, um, Kelly Martin and Susan Lannon. And um, the members that did run for re-election were uh, re-elected. Um, Mr. Farrell elect elected not to um, uh, run for uh, chair uh, this time, so uh, Ms. Jolly um, was appointed as the uh, board chair. Um, I was uh, appointed vice chair. Um, let's see. Um, public comments, just a few highlights from there. There was some concern from town residents about um, uh, the effects that masks are having on the, uh, the students in the schools. Um, and I don't know if you're aware, but the, uh, one, of the, one of the residents, Mr. Uh, Scott Heat, um, had a, a testing unit and he found that the carbon monoxide levels in this room were already above federal guidelines. Did you find that to be correct? That's inaccurate. Okay. I did check with our fire marshal. There must have been something wrong with his meter. I don't believe that he calibrated it um, appropriately. Okay, well, that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> The levels that he was displaying on that meter would have meant that we would all have been unconscious. Okay. Yeah, there was, it seemed to be a little bit of concern, but anyway, I'm glad that's straightened out. Um, oh, there were a couple issues in the schools that um, we're looking to address. Uh, Mrs. Grandelsky pointed out that um, the camera system at um, KIS is not working in parts of the building, and so, um, we're looking to get that addressed uh, as soon as possible. Um, our student board member, Rhiannon Martin, pointed out that um, the PA system cannot be heard in all the bathrooms at the high school. And so, um, you know, when, when emergency codes are called, um, students that might happen to be in the bathroom at the time might not even be aware of what's going on. So that's also a concern. Um, we had our, the school resource officer uh, come to the meeting and address, um, you know, some safety concerns. 
um, <clears throat> he explained um, the code yellow and the code red um, calls in the, in the schools and what they represent because there had been a little confusion as to which was which and there was an improper code called at one point so I think everybody's on board as to what is <clears throat> excuse me what is what at this point um, of course the good news on the football team uh, winning their recent state championship which was a pretty awesome accomplishment and um, also uh, this is from the student board members by the way uh, and they also thank the Big Red Marching Band for their amazing support and also the cheerleaders for their support this season. Uh, fabulous conclusion to the, to the year. Um, and one controversial point was the uh, repair to the elevator at Westfield Avenue. Um, that was explained uh, by Ms. Calorio as to, you know, how that funding was set up to be done and it, it all made perfect sense. We were just concerned with the optics of that um, and um, we, we did approve um, the upgrades and, and the repair to that elevator. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Clark uh, reported that there are no items of concern uh, as far as the November monthly financial report. So that was good news. We're on track there so far. Uh, the robotics trip to Japan was postponed due to um, travel limitations. And um, great news on the transportation front, um, the ongoing issues with uh, not being able to uh, fill all the, or man all the bus routes um, has at least for now been alleviated. And um, we also have new staff that are being trained and will be on the road soon. Uh, we got a COVID update from the superintendent, Mr. Angeli, um, and he explained why Killingly was not able to adopt the screen and stay option because of the, um, the, the measured levels of uh, COVID infections going on and the quarantines. Um, so, you know, we're hoping to get to that point, to, to get to that level at some point, but right now the numbers um, didn't reflect being able to, to do that. Um, we adopted the new, um, the 2022 20, to 2023 uh, district calendar. And um, we also approved the paraprofessional union agreement which had been in contention for, uh, for a little longer than uh, everybody would have liked. And um, that's it. I don't know if there's any questions, but that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. I will open up to council. Any questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Grandelski. With regard, I'm glad to see you're using the non-lapsing account to fix the elevator. That's a, that's the purpose for what that was put in. But maybe can we be more aggressive in using the non-lapsing account? I mean, this would be a nice thing. This is setting the precedent. We're starting to look at, at using it uh, in, in, with the new people and, and whatnot. We haven't used it uh, quite to the same extent before. Um, but I think I, I like that. I, I think that's a good place for it. Um, and that's what it's a non lapsing account for. But we also have sufficient funds in there. And it, I'm looking at some of the year, year ends where the Board of Education is putting money and it goes back into our general fund. If we could be spending items within the non lapsing account so you can recur some of that back. Because once it gets back into the general fund, it's a tough way to go back with the non lapsing account. It's easy for to access it. Right. So just to be nice if we can find other projects and maybe it might take a few years to get them going, but you know, I mean it, it may not be in one particular year, but it may take a little more time and then we can be using this account to its fullest extent. Right. I I personally agree with that, with uh, your opinion on that, and I think um, it's a goal that we need to do. There there is concern from some members that um, I don't want to use the term slush fund because it's obviously not a slush fund, but they don't want too many items to be put into that, and we, they don't want us to be relying on it as too much. 
Um, I don't know if that's a valid concern or not, but that has been brought up. You know, in, in, in other words, it might encourage a little bit of extra spending, which we don't want to get into. But I, I agree with you that that's a good place for a lot of these funds to come from because, you know, rather than return it to the general fund and then go to the town later for money for a project yeah, that could have right. been funded with that. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I, I go along with that. Because in some years, you're putting so much money back that, but if you're not using the non-lapsing account, I, I don't want to call it a slush fund. I'm not going to go. You know, right. I mean, it is there. It's there to, to bail you guys out. But if you have to come to a supplemental appropriation to the council, I've been through that. I do not want to go through that again. That really is a rough. It, it really killed us in, in, in the bond rating. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wood. First off, it's fantastic to finally have a liaison here. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to say, Norm, I'm always, uh, it's always a pleasure to see you and, of course, your lovely wife as well. Um, so just to, you know, first aside there with the, uh, sorry, it's been a very long week there. Um, just uh, uh, with the school buses there, you know, I, I know. You guys, as the board, uh, our superintendent has taken a lot of flack uh, over what has happened. Uh, when I drive around town and I see help wanted signs almost for every industry possible, uh, everybody's struggling. So I'm glad to hear there's progress going on with that. Um, and I really wish you guys well with, with all of that. And uh, obviously you're going in the right direction. Um, I know with uh, in regards to what I've been seeing on the news lately, there's been schools that have had to go to remote learning and or uh, half days or things like that due to uh, staffing issues due to COVID has Killingly seen it? I, I don't think I've seen anything about Killingly. Has that been a concern that's been brought up by the superintendent at all recently to you all or? Well, th there have been staffing issues due to, to quarantines, but by and large, um, We've been doing fairly well on that front as far as uh, the in-person learning. And, uh, and the state is um, not allowing uh, remote learning at this time anyway. So we'd have to apply for a special uh, exemption to, to even go to um, remote learning, I, I believe. So they've been doing a, de a, a good job of uh, maintaining staffing levels to keep, to keep the, the students um, in the, in school learning. Awesome. That's, that's actually, I, A, I didn't know that the state had done that, and B, this is great to know that, the, again, uh, you know, everybody's working together to try to uh, get these uh, situations and continue to mitigate everything that's been going on for now two years. It hurts right. to say that. <laughs> so thank you, Norm. All right. Thanks. Mr. Cattulo. Oh, good afternoon, Norm. Congratulations on the vice chair. Thank you. Um, my question was about the uh, transportation manager there, that one that was there recently, well, not recently, but had left towards the end of the last school year. Did they replace that yet, uh, that position? Yes, we have a new or transportation that. manager. In fact, for a while there, he was driving buses to make up for the personnel shortages that we had. Yeah. He's no longer having to do that. He's able to concentrate on what his job actually is, fortunately. Mr. George. Norm, do you see any, for the unexpended funds account, do you see any maintenance projects that could fall into that coming up right now? Like I read something for tomorrow night, something about a roof, I believe, at KPS. Do you see any other facilities, things that could fall under using those funds? Um, there's always maintenance issues at, you know, that. I understand that. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious. With, I'm just, oh, no, I, I don't, I don't know anything. Nothing comes to the top of, I mean, it. it so it, nothing's been brought to you guys yet? No, not okay. for something that would fall under funding like that. Okay. Major capital saying. projects have been brought up. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Barkley. I, I gave you the two, um, an example of the BOE budget and its um, transparency for the um, Hartford Public Schools 
Um, so we'd like to meet as soon as possible. And so would you bring that information forward to Mr. Angeli? Because we brought that up when February or March of um, last yeah. year about transparency of um, where the BOE finances yeah, are. Um, at this point, we could add it to the agenda for um, the next meeting. But our, our, the, the, our next meeting is tomorrow. I can mention to you know, I can mention it to him and show him um, what we have for right now, but to actually get it on the agenda would have to wait till the following meeting at this point. Does it need to be an agenda item to have a meeting between the BOE and the, yes, the two fiscal subcommittees? I'll address this. I did bring it up at the last BOE meeting I attended. Um, and as I've spoken with Ms. Calorio, she's also spoken to the superintendent, Mr. Angeli. The fiscal subcommittees of the town council and the board of ed would have to have a joint meeting Correct. to go over um, any possible format changes to the budget that the town council would like to see. Um, when it was brought up during the meeting, I believe Ms. Abrams is on the fiscal subcommittee and there was question of... They had not yet created who was on what committees. Okay. So she wasn't going to be back yet. Right, but the um, the chairman of the they were newly organizing, so they were organizing that night. They were they had not they did not uh, appoint their liaisons. I only got that information last week. Okay. Um, so I uh, Miss Jolly was going to be getting it out to all the members of the board of ed, um, and at that point I was going to reach out to Angel um, Mr. Angeli this week to determine. Um, if she, he's got an established uh, fiscal subcommittee, and then we could uh, look at dates. Okay. So um, that's just happened within the last week. Okay. Thank that, you. And I, I forgot to mention that, which is uh, me bad. Um, yeah, we did appoint all new uh, subcommittee members. So I'm I my subcommittees that I'm personally on have changed. I'm off of those, and I'm on new ones, including I'm on fiscal, and I'm on uh, personnel as well thank you um, mr. Whitehead and ms. Wakefield any comments yes go ahead mr. Whitehead uh, tough to hear you but question for you is it accurate that mr. Angeline said that the test and stay is not an option for Killingly at this time that's correct. Did he, do you have any data that he provided to, to come up with that conclusion? Because I know Rhode Island is pretty much in the same situation we are. And they're, they're actually taking it a step further where the, the children that are possibly testing positive or in contact with, with um, positive cases, if they are, if they are asymptomatic, they are keeping them in school, in some schools. And, uh, you know, let's face it, it, if you're in school learning, that's that's the best for the kids. I'm just curious what data he's using to, to come up with that conclusion. Um, he did provide data at the meeting for that. And, uh, but some of, you know, I mean, some of that data is um, interpretive and it's subject right. It's subject to interpretation as to, you know, the, the person reviewing it. Um, and I, I guess you could argue that both ways. His determination was that uh, for now um, we weren't going to utilize it. I don't know if that's changed. That might have changed at this point. I, I'm not sure. But I think, you know, the current wave of the, the, the Omicron uh, variant um, and how quickly it spread um, was you know factored into his decision I'm, I don't want to speak for him but um, that you know the, the the rapid rate of infection I think was was giving them pause also he did have the data on um, the exact numbers and our numbers did not meet the requirements um, f for to, to utilize that program at least at that point in time but that you know that situation can change very quickly and you know they're expecting this wave to pass um you know hopefully um we'll see a, a, a slowdown um it's, it's 
sooner rather than later and maybe we can review that policy or maybe he can review it and we can uh, review it at, at, a, at a, a future meeting and, and get that policy in play because uh, everyone agrees that the uh, in-person learning is absolutely the way that uh, we need to go if unless it's absolutely prohibitive um, health-wise. I don't know if it's cross contamination or whatever have you, uh, but it'd be interesting to see the data that he's basing his decision off of. I don't know if we're privy to that. I can ask uh, Mr. Angeli to forward it to me and I can forward it on to the rest of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do I do have let me let me just look at this quickly because it was on the agenda and some of what he covered is on here. No, it just it just basically what I've already stated. There's no data it contained on this um, okay. agenda. Thanks, Thank you, Ms. Wakefield. Any comments? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> any other questions, comments, Mr. Grandelsky? Right. Yeah. We need to keep the communication. Yes. Thank you. I would just like to add one thing. Um, I don't know if this is something that Kilnally has looked into, but I know uh, Town of Montville was having a situation very similar to what we were where they were struggling to have bus drivers. Um, one thing that's actually in the employees contract for the bus mechanics in Montville is if there is a shortage of bus drivers, they actually have the mechanics go out driving the buses, picking up kids and dropping off kids. I don't know if that's something we've ever looked into, doing the possibility of where in a pinch, if we need one extra driver, um, we're not worrying about, because I know it was talked about at the last meeting, that there were times where there were routes where we weren't even sending buses out when students were having to stay at home. I don't know if that's something we can look into, if it's at all feasible or not. Um, I. You know, I think they did a great job of looking at every option. I mean, I, I don't specifically remember that being mentioned in a meeting, but I think it, it, it might have been. But, um, you know, they, they, they combined routes. Um, they did everything possible. It's just that, you know, there was a couple points there where we got hit with um, COVID infections and, and, and just quarantines with people um, that had to be on quarantine. You can't put... Um, you know, people that were exposed on a bus with a bunch of kids. So, um, yeah, it, it was unfortunately uh, unavoidable at that point. But, uh, you know, hopefully this will continue. We're, you know, we're increasing uh, staffing levels as much as we can to try to get a little bit of a, a buffer there so we're not always just barely uh, covering. And uh, the situation is much better now than it was a few weeks ago. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming. Uh, okay. we, we appreciate all your input. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is reports from liaisons, 11B, Borough Council liaison. Ms. LaBerge, if you could come forward, please. Good evening. So, Michelle, I have an answer for you on the website. It is quite expensive to have it done. It's something we cannot do. We have no funds in our budget this year to do it, so it's something we'll probably look into next year. Okay, so the president and our administrative clerk is going to start working on the ARPA application funds, and we're thinking of hiring a consultant for the process since we don't have the personnel that, that the town does and the suggestion was to check with NECOG and the funding that we receive can be used to hire a consultant. Uh, the con I had talked to you about work on the south side of the firehouse 
and because of material delays, the wrap probably couldn't be done until next month if the material showed up. So it looks like probably the wrapping of the window casings and the painting won't be done until spring. And our IT technology policies and procedures subcommittee has met. They are reviewing procedures and policies from other municipalities. They're going to review them, pick out the ones that fit the borrow the best, and then come back to the council with that, with that list and for the council to vote on. And we also checked with the state to see if the timeline had changed, if we do end up reviewing our charter. And so we, we have that. And for us, we would put the questions on our election ballot in May of 2023 so there wouldn't be a separate election. And that's my report. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Murphy, you had a comment? Yeah, I was going to comment. But if you could just reach out to me, because I, I can never find you. You know what I mean? And I, exchange contact information I've got some ideas for you okay well your information is probably on the town website yeah yeah okay, so it's easier I've been looking looking I can't find you thanks you can probably ask Jean I think the town still has my phone number and email any further comments questions from council mr. Whitehead or Ms. Wakefield no no sir thank you thank you Next up on the agenda is 12A, Discussion and Acceptance of Monthly Budget Reports. Summit, the Summary Report on General Fund Appropriations for Town Government. Can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Mr. Wood. Uh, discussion? Mr. Kirtula. Under, it seems I was talking about library fines and not under uh, for the library fines there that now it's showing that there's uh, four thousand six hundred dollars in fines is that that's fines and fees so that includes copy fees fax fees and all that kind of stuff so that doesn't represent truly just fines fine. um, so I'll be able to break that out when we are ready to kind of dig into that into that question and that um, overall I believe that the fines portion of that is rather small Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Mr. Wood. Just to go with what Ms. Calario said, I, I do remember you saying before that the that portion usually is more the use of the photocopier and uh, any other services the library provides there and the, the fees are, are not fine, the fines are uh, a very, very small portion there. So it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see the numbers when you got them and we're ready to discuss it. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Whitehead or Ms. Wakefield? No. Nope. It'd be interesting to see the, uh, the cost of the books that aren't returned. Would that be in that as well? Um, so um, the cost of the books that are not returned typically when the um, library receives those those go in a special revenue fund so they're not considered a revenue in the general fund um, because they are used to purchase a replacement book um, for that item but um, I can have that breakout separate because that's not considered one of the revenues in the general fund thank yes. you any further comments questions seeing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on on the agenda. Next item up is 12B, discussion acceptance of monthly budget reports, system object based on adjusted budget for the Board of Education. Can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Mr. Grandelsky. Uh, discussion or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on to item 13A, correspondence, communications, and reports, town manager's report. Ms. Gloria, if you could go over this, please. 
Sure, Mary Colorio, town manager. So I gave you the update um, on where COVID is, um, the cases um, broken out by county, um, really focused on hospitalizations. You'll notice that from January 3rd to dis, um, the year, the month over month comparisons, there's substantial increase in the number and the counts of hospitalizations. Um, not so much um, of an increase within Wyndham County. It's fairly flat. So we're not seeing a huge spike in uh, hospitalization cases in Wyndham County. While that fluctuates on a daily basis, um, we um, looking from month over month with regards to Killingly specific, we did see um, a fairly significant increase in confirmed positive cases of COVID. Um, and we unfortunately have experienced um, an additional um, four deaths related to COVID um, within the town. Um, on average, I did include for you the chart that I've been doing the daily um, change chart um, that really encompasses an entire year from January 1st to January 3rd um, of all of 2021. And you'll note that we are seeing that once again, that spike over the winter, you know, the winter time spike over just post holiday. Um, we anticipate that that will begin to subside over the next few weeks. Um, but you'll see that even at this point, our case counts are not as high as what they were even last January. You'll note that there's a couple of days that you, a couple, a couple of points as throughout the year that have significantly higher spikes and those are typically weekend counts. So those typically are accounting for three days worth of activity as opposed to just one. We only, we don't receive counts every single day. We, um, kind of receive the weekend counts over, um, in one fell swoop. Um, ki Killingly, we're continuing to average about 8.5 daily case, uh, d new daily cases um, within town, which isn't um, a significant shift from last month. Um, so um, I think we're seeing um, a lot more of asymptomatic um, people that are testing positive that don't necessarily have symptoms. Um, but um, there are plenty out there that are having significant symptoms. Um, so we've not changed any protocol or any operations within the town um, as far as town procedures. I do continue to remind staff to make sure that they are sanitizing their areas appropriately, appropriately social distancing. Um, if we have staff that um, um, test positive, we are following the new CDC guidelines of um, five-day quarantine five-day strict mask wearing. So we are following that protocol. Um, and we have not had any significant COVID impact on any one of our um, departments. Um, we, while we've had employees impacted, we have not had any major impact to a single department. Um, I did incorporate um, the year, the month over month change with regards to vaccination um, percentages. And you'll note, you'll see those um, we continue to increase the number of individuals that are fully vaccinated in all categories. Um, I uh, reviewed for you the distribution of the home test kits that we received. So the town, we received our first allotment of home test kits on Saturday night on the 1st. Um, we received National Guard came out and um, distributed. I scheduled and we performed our distribution, our public distribution of those kits on Wednesday, um, January 5th. Um, we had um, 28 or so cases. So we had uh, about 1,200 or so kits to, for us to be able to um, distribute to the public. The event was publicized to start at 6 p.m. and end at 8.30 p.m. We were doing it here at the town hall in the rear parking lot. Um, what I did was I had our staff and we've had our staff and all of our the neighboring people that utilize our parking lot. We had everyone vacate the rear parking lot by 2 p.m. Um, we blocked it off. I had law enforcement securing the parking lot so we didn't have anybody stacking up or piling up within the parking lot. Um, and we didn't allow them to park on the road to form any lines early on. Um, we had them keep moving um, so we weren't blocking or clogging up downtown um, in any of our streets on the in immediately affected area to remove congestion um, we were pretty well set up by f a little after four o'clock um, within the parking lot and all of our volunteers were ready 
and we were seeing a fairly steady flow of um, those individuals that were circling, waiting for the opportunity to be able to begin forming a line. So in an effort to not to, to continue to have traffic flowing and to not have a bottleneck of people just sitting in line waiting for six o'clock, I opened the gates at 4.30 and we began distribution at 4.30. Um, we distributed from 4.30 to 8.30 and we ended the night with still 11 boxes of kits left. So we had a little over um, uh, almost 500 kits remaining by the end of by the end of the evening. Most of the evening, um, it was no lines, no waiting. I, I think the average wait time in line was five minutes. Um, our we had individuals stationed um, on the roadway to check IDs to verify residency. Um, if they didn't have verified residency, they weren't allowed into the parking lot. We did not have very many that, um, that had to be um, moved through the, on the roadway side and not brought in through the distribution. Um, and uh, we've had four volunteers. Four of us were, were set up to be able to um, you know, distribute to the cars. We didn't have anybody really waiting through that process either. So um, it was very successful. During our distribution, we were um, communicating to Winnie and our social media platforms to remind people to come out. Um, and, you know, as we as we had lulls in um, traffic coming in, we would make sure we pushed out, you know, remember to come out. Um, so we thought it was very successful. Um, with the remaining kits, um, we, I, um, we distributed to our first responders. So uh, KB and all of our fire departments received um, home test kits. We increased the, our distribution to our elderly housing complexes because um, they've been hit fairly hard recently with um, COVID. So we increased our distribution to them as well. I did distribute um, kits to each employee. Most all of our employees have been at work during their own personal town's distribution. Um, and so I felt it only fair that they also get an opportunity for a home test kit. So we distributed to all of our town employees. Um, we have also, um, we're distributing to NEPS, Northeast Placement Services. Um, they are a vulnerable population and we're identifying vulnerable population for continued distribution. Um, we did receive um, another, another distribution. We got our, our second distribution, um, uh, and we did get about 1,300 kits in that distribution. Um, we received those that f the very next day, Thursday. Go figure. It was great timing by the state. Um, so we received those on Thursday. Um, I have um, reached out to, we're trying to continue to reach vulnerable population. We are trying to connect with our home daycares because that is an area of significant um, impact is our home daycares. So we're trying to identify home daycares for distribution. Um, and um, some of our, in our businesses around town where we've been, I, I've been looking to distribute to the businesses because there's been a number that have been impacted by production and that has a domino effect um, by uh, not being able to have their shifts filled. So um, we're trying to um, help mitigate some of those factors within our, um, within our businesses. Um, I did make the announcement to Kate at our, at the last uh, KBA meeting, Killing the Business Association meeting, that any of our businesses that uh, are in need of um, home test kits to reach out and contact me. Um, I've had a couple of, couple do that. Um, and uh, so we're almost through distributing the remainder of the kits that we've received. There is still um, a few left. Um, I will say that we did have set aside a reserve some last week that we were distributing for those that just couldn't make it to the first distribution. And so we did distribute some here from the town hall to the general public. Um, and we were very cautious in that, in that when people called, we would ask them if they were symptomatic, if they were symptomatic. We met them in the parking lot. We didn't have them come into the building. Um, I didn't want to, you know, bring it into the building. Um, we have since discontinued that process um, as we continue to try and fill the requests to the vulnerable populations and to our businesses at this point in time. Um, and I don't foresee that we're going to do another mass distribution um, because I think that we will have fully distributed the remaining kits um, probably by the end of this week. Um, 
So um, I think that we did a really good job with trying to hit really every quadrant of the town um, and population and um, and businesses with uh, providing some level of home test kits um, to anyone who you know potentially needed it. Um, so that was the home test kit distribution, and I, we have not heard anything from the state about having another round of distribution yet. So um, that's still up in the air. Um, we still we did receive a large distribution of um, N95 KN95 masks. Um, that we have so we do have those and can we we um, are also um, offering those for distribution to our businesses and to anyone who might need those um, but I'm not necessarily looking at doing a mass you know a drive-through distribution for N95 masks <laughs> um, but we do have them here and they'll they'll be great for staff as well as um, you know recreation can use them for um, any of their events as well. Um, we held our employee luncheon on December 16th. This is an annual employee luncheon, and I, we did hold this um, within the indiv the three individual buildings. Um, so we simply because there was there's not really a, a gathering place large enough in town that everyone felt comfortable being able to really spread out and, and distance well enough. Um, so I wanted to be respectful of the employees' uh, concerns, and so we held the luncheons. Um, so each building got received catered food in a, um, a buffet-style format. But it gives us an opportunity to recognize those long-serving and the years of service from our employees. And I just want to highlight these um, because, you know, this shows the dedication and the longevity of the commitment of our staff. Um, Joe Bogoslovsky, Bogoslovsky is 15 years. Tracy Bragg is 15 years. Paul Brown at 15 years. Elizabeth Wilson, 15 years. Matt Salsi, 20 years. Allison Whiston, 20 years. Tristan and I always mess up her last name, Mizowski is 25 years, um, Christine Fitzsimmons, 35 years, and Diane Girton at 40 years. So, um, you know, we, and we have a lot of staff that they've, you know, they've been here for their careers. Um, this, has, this hasn't just been a stopover. This has been a career for them, and they've been dedicated, and they show that dedication and commitment to this community every day, all day long. So um, I just want to applaud them for that, for that, for those years of service. Um, I gave you a brief um, update on some of the economic development. So Black Pond Brews, some of you were able to attend that ribbon cutting. It was a great event, um, really great um, new location. Very excited to see them in their new location and get them and get them open and wish them much success. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to stop by Ken A, uh, NK Asian Market, they're now in the former um, Busquet Appliance um, building. It's a really great expansion to that. So they moved from, you know, kind of the corner of Dyer Street. Um, uh, so they're now open um, and uh, really excited about their expansion. Um, so definitely go check that one out. Um, the Economic Development Commission received a presentation, which I had attached from Wendy Burry for the cultural coal from of the cultural coalition on um, how to create a cultural district and this is really about you know is that something that the economic development commission really wants to pursue in designating an area of killingly as a cultural district it does give an opportunity for the town to seek additional funding um, to really kind of fold in additional arts and culture within the community um, and it's a more dynamic commission than just the economic development commission it really needs to be a subset and it goes through through what are all those requirements so it was a really well-rounded presentation I believe I, I included that presentation in there um, but I the economic development is now going to have further discussions on the direction and path they are looking to go with that um, and then just to give you some grant updates um, the Historical Society was very successful in being awarded a $5,300 grant from the Connecticut Humanities Organization for Technology Improvements um, they were our Economic Development Director Jill St. Clair worked with them on um, getting that grant submitted. So congratulations to the <laughs> Historical Society for that. They're going to be purchasing some new equipment to digitize some of their collections. So um, um, it'll help make things more public-facing 
for them. So that's a really great opportunity. Um, on the town side, we're submitting two applications under the Connecticut Communities Challenge Grant. So one of them is a placemaking grant really um, to um, that dovetails with the project that Economic Development Commission is looking at on the um, municipal parking lot side of um, behind uh, at the at the School Street parking lots over by the courthouse. They're looking at, um, <clears throat> they have a, uh, they have a consultant working on um, reimagining some of those spaces to make placemaking spaces. So we're looking at putting in a grant for that. That one's about a million dollars. And the other grant that um, I think fits well into the um, focus of this program is for the community center, the renovations at Westfield Avenue for the community center. So the Con Connecticut Communities Challenge Grant Program is very competitive grant, but it's focused on improving livability, vibrancy, convenience, and appeal of communities throughout the state. Um, it's being administered through the Connecticut um, DECD, De um, Department of Economic Development, and they're awarding between 20 and 50 million dollars statewide um, and the grant sizes are between 1 million and 10 million so if you think about that if they're only going to award 20 million dollars my grant ask for this is 9.5 million for the community center and uh, the placemaking grant request is a million um, so that 20 to $50 million does not go very far across the entire state. So it is very competitive. And I think we've made a really good case. Um, Jill and I were working on that grant. It's due on this Friday. Um, I'll be submitting that uh, hopefully Thursday night um, to for consideration. We did already submit our, our intent to submit. So that's already been in place. Um, but I think that both projects... Um, the Westfield Avenue project, because it's shovel-ready, those are the projects that they're looking for, shovel-ready. So um, I'm hoping that we will um, have get at least a good look on this. The, the state could have already decided who, where they're going to spend the money, but um, they did indicate that it, there appears to be a round two. Um, so this is designated as round one, so um, it may queue us up for a round two possibility. So um, I, you know... Even putting this in at this point in time with such com high competition, I, I don't think I think it's a good opportunity for us to do that. And even if we're not awarded on this time around, um, I think it gives us high potential for award in a future round. So um, uh, that's definitely been something that we've had to roll up our sleeves on. Jill has spent a, a fair amount of time um, working on both of those um, grant applications um, with me. So um, that's kind of rounds out my reports if anybody has any questions mr. wood just a quick question for you I know you mentioned the n95 masks there um, are they n95 or kn95 because there is a difference there is a difference and I believe they're kn95 when I've talked to Randy Burchard around this yeah. um, he said that they were missing one level of stamp of approval for them to be truly official N95s? Correct. It's NIOSH standards that yes. uh, are required. And so uh, that's why I asked. So the boxes on the outside say N95, but I don't believe that they have that certification. Okay. So I think they're truly KN95s. Yeah, KN95s. I know for us, we've been given the, the uh, guidance from the state to say use KN95s like you would a regular surgical mask versus a true N95 that meets NIOSH standards as a true yep. N95. So there's a difference there. That's why I ask. I will say they are very form-fitting and tight to the face. Yes. yes. Depending on the ones, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, questions? And if I can, I want to thank uh, Tammy Wakefield as well as Randy Burchard, Paul Gazzola, uh, Maureen Hayes, uh, Becky Duquette, uh, Jonathan Blake, and our law enforcement team for putting together and and organizing and and doing the distribution for the COVID-19 kits. It was very quickly put together, but um, they ran that fantastically. 
Um, so just a huge credit and thanks to all of them that just literally just jumped right in there and um, helped us get us done and made sure, Jonathan, that we didn't get run over. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm glad to hear that the distribution went well. Um, I just do have one question. Um, as far as uh, applications that have come into the town for distribution of um, the COVID grant money, um, how many applications have we had so far? Are we talking about um, the ARPA funds? Yes, the ARPA funds. So the ARPA funds, I want to say we've had, a, uh, off the top of my head, I think we have about 12 or 13 that have come in to the town. Um, I'll be putting that package together for a presentation to the fiscal subcommittee of the town council. Um, so those that are, and I don't recall which one of you guys are on the fiscal subcommittee, I'll be reaching out to you over this week to try and coordinate um, what is the best date and times for a meeting um, so then we can get something scheduled to begin the review of those ARPA fund applications. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you saw the email that I forwarded to you today. Yeah, that, I, that's not ARPA that. funds. Okay. That's CARES Act funding. That's different. Okay. That's a complete. That was what was distributed Previous. previously um, last year. And um, uh, Jennifer Hawkins, our finance director, is the custodian of those records. Okay. Um, so I forwarded on to that onto her. She's currently out right now. She will respond to that when she's returned to work. Okay. Thank you. Um, as far as the fiscal subcommittee, I believe it's myself, uh, Ms. Barclay, Mr. Wood. And I believe Mr. Katula is the alternate on yeah. the fiscal subcommittee. I was going to look it up and email you guys tomorrow. <laughs> I just don't have the list in front of me right now. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Yes. Um, I got a question with the mask and the test kits. Were those supposed to be earmarked for the residents? So they were supposed to be distributed among the communities. I, they were actually we were we were given um, directed or suggestions by um, the state as well as the Department of Health to not limit it to residents. That everyone's in this together. Make sure that you distribute it to everyone and anyone who needs a test kit. But that was guidance. Most when, almost all the towns locally that did mass distributions limited their mass distributions to residents only um, just as a way to manage the mass distribution because we all had limited supply but um, the actual distribution was not uh, was always given to as guidance from the state and the health department to distribute it broadly across the community okay. it just seems that we didn't know did we offer the masks at the time we gave out the kits? No, right? Yes, no, we did. Um, everyone received did. Two, two masks with the kit. So they had like a little oh, bundle great. that was given to them. Awesome. I was just I was just going the way of, if we didn't hand out the mask with the kit and we kept them for the town employees, it kind of, if I was, you know, on the outside looking at it, I would think that, you know, it's the town trying to offset the cost of buying an N95 mask, you know what I mean? So if you sent them out, I think the the distribution from what I heard was, was phenomenal. So great job on that. Thank you. Ms. Wakefield, do you have any comments? Not at this time. Any further comments? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Ms. Gloria. We'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is 13B, memo from Board of Ed, use of non-lapsing funds. Ms. Gloria, can you go over this, please? Yeah, this is just a notification to the Town Council and in accordance with the MOU that the Town has with the Board of Education regarding the use of non-lapsing funds. Um, the Town doesn't Town Council doesn't need to necessarily take action on this because the, legisl the legislation that created the non-lapsing fund does not allow the Town Council to reject or, or prevent expenditure, but it does give you the notification of what they're utilizing the funds for. So this is just the communication for that. Thank you. And uh, for those, uh, those at home that are listening, uh, the funds were... It was $100,000 that were 
used for repairs of the elevator at the Westfield Avenue building. Um, it, this is an item that had come up during uh, two previous Board of Ed meetings that I was liaison to. And at the last Board of Ed meeting, as the liaison from the Board of Ed had said, the Board of Ed did agree to mm -hmm. cover the maintenance costs on that elevator. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments from council? Seeing none, we'll move on on the agenda. Next item up is item 14A, unfinished business for town council action. Appointment of town attorney. This item was tabled uh, at our last regular meeting until today, January 11th, 2022. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this resolution to appoint the town attorney? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski, seconded by Mr. Wood. I will open up for discussion comments. If I may. Yes, please. Mary Colorio, so the resolution before you is to uh, essentially reappoint Haller and Sage as the town attorney. Um, the town has utilized Haller and Sage as the town attorney for the last two years. Um, I did provide you a detailed schedule of all the town, all the attorney's fees that the town has paid. Um, and you will note that um, back in 1617, um, the town was, the town had transitioned. Um, we had attorney Sainage as our town attorney. Um, he gave notice and um, retired. Good for you, Bill. Um, so the town at that, all, all the towns in the northeast corner, essentially, we all had to go out for bid for um, a town attorney because he was like the town attorney for almost all of us. Um, so we, the town went out to bid at the time. They did select in that process Martha Kalina, and they had uh, entered into a fee arrangement with a retainer cost, which you see the breakout below of Martha Kalina's retainer, um, and then what was considered other matters. So um, anything that was considered litigation was not included in the retainer fee. It was, an, it was separately billed outside of the retainer fee. Um, and then um, you will note that through that time period, you will still see that the town the town was still utilizing Halloran and Sage as an attorney. Um, so we had been utilizing them when under Sainage, we were utilizing them for labor. They were our labor attorneys, so they represented us at any union negotiations and they handled any of our grievance matters and stuff like that. When we transitioned over to Martha Kleina, they have labor attorney in, in with um, their services, however, uh, under Mirtha Kalina, the town had a number of conflicts with cases. And so when Mirtha had a conflict, the town still needed representation. And we uh, utilized Halloran and Sage in those uh, situations. Um, two years ago, um, the town, the, I recommended that the council revisit looking at uh, legal, the legal firm at the time because of the number of conflicts that we had been having and our fee structure, I don't know what I didn't believe was um, overall beneficial to the town. Um, and so at that point in time, the town did do another RFP for legal services in which we transferred to Halloran and Sage. I will say it's not average, it's not typical that the town transitions legal services as frequently. Um, there is a heavy lift when you're transitioning um, legal cases. Um, and I have you know, talk to all of my staff that has direct conversation and in and direct communication with Halloran and Sage to determine how their performance has been over the last two years. They've been, and the response I got from staff and my experience as well has been Halloran and Sage has been very responsive um, to all of the staff's requests and concerns. Um, they've been readily available to attend meetings, both virtually and in person. Um, and, um, <laughs> They, we have not, we have not had any, I think we've only had one conflict on a case, on a tax appeal case, and that was it. Um, everything else we've been able to manage fully, completely um, with Halloran and Sage. What you'll notice, Martha Kalina still has fees. I left one case with Martha, Martha Kalina when we transitioned. I left the Davco case because we thought we were getting to the finalization of the Davco case, and it didn't make sense to transition such a 
such a very detailed file and case to a new attorney. Um, when we really thought that we were going to be getting to um, a finalized judgment on that case. Um, and that case has continued to drag on. Um, we are in the process of going and finalizing to get to trial at this point in time. So instead of just doing status updates with the judge, um, we are going to be going to trial, and which is another reason why I have not transitioned that one to Halloran and Sage. I have left that one with Martha Kleina because of the the significant details and historical information on that file. I think it's just in the town's best interest to maintain that with Martha Kleina through the end. Um, but all of our other cases have transitioned successfully and well to Halloran and Sage. So my recommendation to the town council is to reappoint Halloran and Sage as the town's town's attorney. Thank you, Mr. Granowski. You are correct. You're right. It's Thank 11 you. Maple Street. It's the corner That's building. Talk to me. Why is that dragging on? But this is appropriate. So. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Thank you. I will open up for questions, comments, discussion. Mr. Wood. Honestly, I uh, again was uh, I think at our last meet, re last regular meeting, uh, Rich Roberts came out, uh, did a phenomenal job answering any questions we had. Um, I you know, having now been able to meet both Martha Kleina and, the, and Helen and Sage folks, um, I, both of them I think are very well qualified, but it makes no sense to me, in all honesty, to keep flip-flopping and having expenses uh, with trying to transition from one, one attorney to another. Um, as uh, I know Mary had said in the last meeting, uh, usually an RFP is every, few e every five years or so, five, ten, if not a little longer than that. Um, so just to save, <coughs> save a couple of pennies, I'm, I'm happy with keeping them. Thank you. Any other comments? I also just wanted to let everyone know, I forgot to mention this, that um, Haller and Sage has also done a number of trainings for our boards and commissions as well as offered uh, trainings to staff as well. And that's all, um, we don't get charged for that. We don't get additional um, uh, fees for that. Um, if I remember correctly, that is something that was brought up during the interview process, um, not just uh, two years ago, but also two years prior to that when Martha Kalina was chosen. Um, that was something that Martha Kalina had offered as well. Um, I believe at that time all the attorneys' firms that interviewed uh, four years ago, that was something that all of them had agreed to do. Um, I do have... Uh, couple questions because I'm looking at the breakdown on some of these I know that um, the transition from attorney St. Ange to Martha Kalina started um, early 2018 um, looking at the breakdown because I see Martha Kalina was a hundred thousand um, dollars and then if you go down to where uh, it, it's broken down to just Martha Kalina um, you've got the breakdown of 36,000 and then the 64,300. Now, that one case, the, the DAVCO case that you had referred to, do you know how much of the fees we got for other matters were for that specific case? So I don't have it broken out specifically here and I can get you those numbers, but I will say that, f so the town received a judgment in 2020 for prior legal fees that encompassed essentially two years, and that was 54000 So I'm going to say that of that 64000 probably about 20000 maybe a little less, was DAVCO, was that, was that specific case, but I would have to go and pull the exact numbers because okay. I don't have that here on the spreadsheet. And okay. Um, I was just, tr just trying to compare um, the, what cost savings there were because I did look at the 2020 to 2021, um, it was slightly higher than um, the 18 to 19. Um, so I wasn't sure how much of that had to do with the, uh, the DAFCO case. For Martha Kalina? Um, yes, because there was 72,000 mm -hmm. in 2021, 2020 to 2021. Right, and that's essentially all okay. DAFCO. 
that's all that one case essentially. Okay. So hopefully when that case is settled, we can see substantial savings on. Right, because you'll note that for general legal fees, um, our general legal fees were only 46000 and that that's for Halloran and Sage. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Yeah, yeah. No, they're still deposing witnesses. Due to the fact that this is an open case, I I can't I can't yeah. comment any further yeah. on the case, but um, it, it's just in the we're yeah we're still waiting for um, for dates. Thank you. Uh, so I will read the resolution. Um, the item is consideration and action on a resolution to appoint a town attorney. Um, this item is to consider appointing a town attorney in accordance with section 902 of the town charter per recent changes to the section the town attorney must be appointed no later than the 15th day of February following each biennial town election this item will appear on agendas until action is taken um, we have a motion in the second is there any further discussion Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on on the agenda. The next item up is 15A, consideration and action on a resolution, resolution setting the date and time for the town council goal setting session. Can I get a motion to adopt this? I wouldn't have an motion yet because we don't you have don't date, have time, date and set. location set okay. in there. So this was really to begin the discussion of what date and time and then ultimately location as well. Um, so in years past, um, the town council has held goal setting sessions in different locations other than just here in this room um, and have used it. It's always open to the public, but have used it as an opportunity to kind of be in a different setting to, um, you know, um, just make it um, a little bit more free flow of uh, comments and interaction, um, more like a workshop and less like a, an actual council meeting. Um, so just as an option, again, if it, if it is located outside of this room, it's not, it wouldn't be, um, televised or, or live streamed, but, um, in years past, we've, um, also done it in other places where, you know, before we, when we only use channel 22, it wasn't put on channel 22 either. Um, and it really, I think afforded the council members, especially new members to really be able to have an opportunity to voice, um, you know what was what they thought their goals or or um, initiatives might be so just to give um, some options or some discussion for the council to consider um, we could definitely still hold it here um, as an option um, the community center is always an option or I could look for an alternate space um, in in you know in another place so just wanted to get the feel of the council on this Uh, yeah. Yes, the previous two that I've been a part of um, were both here mm -hmm. in, the, in the town meeting room. Um, one thing I will say, if we're going to hold it in a different location, I would not want to have it in any smaller of a venue than this. Correct. Um, especially considering with the how high the case count is in a community with COVID. Um, I would like to have it televised um, due to the fact of with with COVID transmissions and case counts where they're at right now mm -hmm. if there are people that don't feel comfortable coming I would want them to be able to at least listen to what's going on mm -hmm. I know that wouldn't give them an opportunity um, if we do have public comment during the goal setting meeting it wouldn't give them an opportunity to speak but at least they can listen to what's mm -hmm. going on and, and be aware of um, where the council wants to see this town going um, as far as the date and time 
Um, I know during the week, um, this I know from past experience, this meeting can get pretty long. Um, if it were to be held during the week, uh, we could be running into the meeting being very late. Um, I would prefer uh, to have it on a weekend as we have the past uh, two that we've had. We're both on Saturday mornings. Um, as I believe that would allow the majority of the council to be able to attend um, and also be in a manner where we haven't worked all day and your mind is a little more free to bounce around different ideas. <coughs> that being said, um, since this is an open discussion, if we were to have the meeting either the 22nd or 29th, um, if we want to set a date and time, um, or if we wanted to do the exactly the 23rd or the 30th, so either the 22nd or 23rd or 29th or 30th, um, if it were on a Sunday, I would definitely like to do um, early afternoon. So any council members who do want to attend church, it wouldn't conflict with that. Uh, I would prefer early afternoon on a Sunday. Sunday Only afternoon? Only the fact that we have the shop open on the weekends. Okay. And you said you work on the 29th and 30th? Being 30th? a new member, I'd like to attend. Oh, 22nd, 23rd. So you'd be available 29th or 30th. Yep. It is, uh, I prefer it not televised. The last two I've been to, there's been no public yeah. participation. And whatever, we always have a release to Winnie or whatever, what our top five to seven goals are that we would like to try to achieve so that it gets out to the public in that form. And then it's more of a relaxed, a more relaxed, free flowing workshop, as Mary said, where uh, you don't feel like you're, you know, if you say something. It's just more relaxed, and it's and like I say, it all ends up getting out to Winnie in a uh, news thing. Uh, so as far as I think it'd be more comfortable if it wasn't televised. If people want to come, that's fine. But uh, we typically haven't done it that way in the last okay. couple of years. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, what would be the possibility if we're not going to do televised? We could possibly use like the high school auditorium to where if people did want to come they can at least space out further I would probably look to utilize the community center um, okay. auditorium okay um, Actually, that's you true. could There's still space out there yeah. um, and probably meet the the number of people that might want to come out and watch um, okay. in that environment um, I'd have to check availability um, on either of those days but I'm thinking off the top of my head we might be able to accommodate but that's where I would okay. um, if we have a cold spell like we're having right now, will the HVAC system there have the room warm enough so we don't get frostbite? So the heat tends to work in the in the auditorium. Okay. It's the cooling system that doesn't work. So we wouldn't want to do it in August, but um, yeah, so typically the theater has heat. Okay. Uh, going to some meetings over there and some of the, I guess you call it classrooms where the, they have the ceiling mounted heaters there and you can't hear who's talking in here. It's <laughs> right, yeah, the theater's not quite like that with, yeah, the, with okay. the heat, but um, you know, we could, we could look to do it there. Um, and if it ends up being that it's not available, we can always, right, we can change the location without having to have the council take a new separate action on that. Okay. All right, so Ulo, you said the 22nd, 23rd, you're available. No. Or excuse me, other way around, 20, 29th and 30th, you are available. All right. Um, Patty, days you'd be available of those four? 29th and 30th. Okay. All right, Mr. Cotullo, 29th and 30th work for either one of those days work for you? Uh, the 30th would work. I wouldn't have to take off at work. To okay. Mr. Wood? Any day you want. Ms. Murphy. Yep. Okay. Mr. Grandelski. Ms. Wakefield. 
Uh, if it's going to be the Sunday, I would definitely appreciate it if it's in the afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Whitehead, so you had said um, Sunday afternoons would be best for you with the 30th work? Yes, it would. Okay. All right. So the consensus I'm seeing would be uh, best option would be the 30th in the afternoon. Um, Ms. Wakefield, what time would work for you, seeing how you're the one you had uh, expressed wanting to have it in the afternoon? Uh, well, I sh I'm usually home from church by noontime, so. Okay. Um, and Mr. Whitehead, what time would you be available on that Sunday? I'll make it work, whatever. Okay. I, I'll, I'll get somebody to cover me. Okay. So if we did, let's say, 2 p.m., um, how does that sound for everyone? Any Any objections to that? Okay, so we're looking at Sunday the 30th at 2 p.m. And as far as the location, um, I know a couple of different options have been talked about. Um, uh, Ms. Barclay, do you have a preference, whether community center or here? Okay. Uh, Ms. George, Mr. Cretula. I prefer here, but I'm still in the location. Mr. Wood. I'm with Mr. Tool. I'd prefer here, but either or it works for me. Okay. Yeah, if there's a preference, I'd be here. Ms. Murphy? No preference. Mr. Grandelsky? Here or prefer here, but still over there, it's okay. 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 Ms. Wakefield? Um, have, having had meetings in the, in the auditorium over there, um, in, even if even if the heat is working, it does have a ten. It's pretty drafty in that in that auditorium. So um, I would prefer the town hall. I mean, I highly doubt um, the public will show up. Um, but it'd also be a lot easier to hear everybody in a smaller space than. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Whitehead. Majority. Excuse me, what was that? It doesn't matter to me. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So it looks like the preference is going to be here. Um, the one question I do want to pose to everybody and let everybody uh, weigh in on is televised or non-televised? It honestly doesn't matter to me. Either way, it doesn't matter. Ms. Wakefield and Mr. Whitehead, any preference? Non-committal. Okay. No. All right. Well, um, okay. All right. My only thought process on that was if there were people who, who were uncomfortable coming in person. Uh, but looking at the amount of people who showed up, as, as you had stated, at the, at the last two, um, if the same amount of people show up again this year, um, there is ample room to socially distance. But I would put a caveat to that. It's not just about those who show up. Um, some people do still uh, watch of either through Facebook or Channel 22 if they're not on Facebook, things like that. So honestly, televising isn't a horrible idea. So that way there, again, they get to see everything that's going on and um, – you know, th there's that level of transparency as well of the council. Uh, obviously, like we've mentioned, it's going to get p posted on Winnie you know, the next day, but uh, or that day probably. But um, you know, again, just gives them that level of we're not trying to secretly hide something or something like that. We we really do. Uh, we're we're pretty much an open book, regardless. Reach out anytime. Feel free. But um, I, I definitely have zero opinion one way or another on televising. But okay. Um, my understanding is the last, at least the last one, if not the previous two, were not televised. It was only live. Um, so if we were to stay consistent um, with the way it's been over the past four years, uh, being the last, the last two goal-setting meetings, um, neither one being televised but being open to the public, um, I would also like to throw in there that we can still receive 
public comment for that meeting via email um, or mailing into the town hall as we do public comment um, for our regular and special town council meetings. That way it does give them another opportunity to make public comment without having to come in person. Um, so we will go with untelevised but allow uh, members of the community to make comments either coming in person um, or you can email or uh, mail through the Postal Service to the Town Hall and just use the uh, town's website. You can look at all our other town meetings agendas and they show you where to email um, or to mail the public comments into. So now that we so we've got a date being the 30th, a time being 2 p.m. and location being here in the town meeting room. Um, so our item right now is a uh, resolution setting the date and time for the town council goal setting session. Um, be it resolved by the town council of the town of Killingly that the town council will hold a goal setting session as follows. The date will be January 30th. The time will be 2 p.m. The location will be in the town meeting room at the town hall. Can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Mr. Katula. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on in the agenda. The next item up is consideration and action on appointing special counsel. The town has engaged with Pullum and Comley to perform tax sales. This firm has conducted these tax sales on behalf of the town for many years. The legal fees are not paid by the town. They are included in a tax sale cost paid by the buyer. Um, can I get a motion to adopt this resolution? I'll make that motion. Motion has been made by Mr. Catula. Second. Seconded by Mr. Wood. Uh, Ms. Gloria, could you go over this, please? <clears throat> the town engages with two additional what we would call special counsels. So these are attorneys that um, focus on specialty areas. One being our um, tax sale attorney. So this uh, Pullman and Connolly we have uh, contracted with for um, probably the last couple of decades even. Adam Cohen has been the specialty person, specialty attorney that has run um, the majority of our tax sales. Um, as it's stated in the item, the town does not pay those legal fees. Those legal fees come out of the actual tax sale itself, so they're paid for by the buyer of that tax sale. Um, and I will say there's not very many other, I don't, the vast majority of towns across the state utilize Adam Cohen for um, tax sale. It's a very specialty area, um, has very specific um, laws and procedures around a tax sale and he has performed those um, very well and very professionally. I've attended many of his uh, tax sales um, and, and done very well. So the recommendation is to remain with Pullman and Comley for that. The other uh, attorney that we contract with is for our bond council. So this is specific to bond, uh, the town bonding, borrowing money, and closing on any of those financial transactions. Um, the, the firm that we had been previously using for quite some time was Day Pitney. The staff that we've been using at Day Pitney transitioned to Pullman and Comley this last year. We remained with that staff um, for continuity. We have a number of projects that have been years, some decades, with the WPCA in the making. And um, having that continuity of that staff throughout that entire process is been critical in being able to do our financial closing and not incurring additional fees with regards to having to have somebody recreate the back uh, transaction files on those, on those. So we only pay the bond council when we actually close. It's done during the financial transaction. Very similar to what somebody would do when they're closing on a mortgage. 
um, you pay your mortgage attorney. This is very, this, you know, if you want to equate it, that's a similar situation. Um, so my recommendation is to remain, is to um, move forward with Pullman and Connolly um, for remaining that continuity with that uh, legal team that we have had over the years that have overseen our debt issuances. Um, uh, Judith Blank was the one that um, attended some of your meetings when you were discussing the community center, the KMS project and the community center project. Um, she attended those meetings. Um, that's our, that still would remain to be our um, bond counsel would be Judith Blank. Thank you. Any questions, comments from council? Mr. Whitehead or Ms. Wakefield? No, oh, sir. Thank you. Seeing no comments, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is council member reports and comments. Uh, Mr. Whitehead, would you like to start? I don't know if you have any, seeing how you're uh, fairly new. I have no comment. No, okay. Keep it uh, easy. Ms. Wakefield. Um, EDC, um, I attended that last Tuesday. Um, part of the town manager's uh, report um, included um, a presentation from the representative um, from the state. Uh, we are, the EDC had already um, paid a consultant who actually um, had done preliminary drawings for an area um, for development that would fit perfectly in um, with that whole cultural district um, commission thing. It would actually, um, there was, there, we would actually have to create another commission, which I know would be a charter change, or you create a subcommittee in, in an existing commission, which is what most towns do just because it makes it a little easier. Um, the, the composition for these, these cultural district commissions um, actually include um, artists as well as business owners and as well as community members so that, um, and basically it's, it's basically um, um, like heritage tourism and and killing only does i mean the reality is is we the pieces are all sitting there i mean we've got a beautiful historic town uh, we have historic buildings uh and just it's it's a way to create a destination kind of like putnam did with their antique districts a few you know de decades ago um it would it would create a place for um people to come to Killingly or want to come to Killingly uh and it would encourage economic development and growth uh so it, it was actually um a very the two two presentations that were put together were really um were good um hopefully uh, those grants will come through uh the uh, lady from the state when she saw the presentation that was put on from um, what the EDC had already put together, um, she was super excited because basically she told them that they they were um, they were they were well on their way to creating a, a historic uh, a cultural district commission or wouldn't having in place what they needed for a cultural district commission in order to get um, to qualify for those state funds and stuff. So. Hopefully um, those grants will come through, um, but uh, it, it was it was a well-run meeting. Um, it had had the two presentations, so it almost almost ran into the town council space. But uh, it, it it's um, other than that, um, and I did take part, and I didn't, as Mary mentioned, the uh, distribution. Uh, we we were so so ready for for lines and people being rude and and short tempered and and it went so smooth and it was really nice to see all the positive comments on our social media posts uh, about hey no no wait went through really easy 
uh, it, it was well organized and, and I was glad to be able to help with that. Thank you very much, Mr. Grindelsky. Uh, the Conservation Commission, they were, they're working on their um, con um, environmental award. Um, they were also working on trails on various uh, conservation properties, the Litchfield Avenue property along the Quinnebog River in Rogers and the Quandock property. And um, they're pushing staff on the forest, on a forest management plan for the Chase Reservoir property. Thank you. Ms. Murphy? Is the uh, Pollution Commission. Uh, I went with Ed, and uh, they basically said they're on budget this month, and that was good. Uh, the upgrade seems to be working because the phosphorus was way low, and uh, the numbers look great. Um, they discussed with Frito Lay a couple of shutdowns, uh, really just information for them. It probably affects their process. Um, upgrade. Basically, all they have left is a punch list. That was my understanding. Um, there was a, a proposal on the table to store energy from Titan Energy Battery Storage, and they basically decided no, that uh, the company wanted so much maintenance, wanted them to do so much maintenance that they may have ended up losing money in the deal. So for right now, that's off the table. Uh, Key Bank, I don't really remember what that was. Uh, key Bank, uh, they recommended a Key Bank tie into Main Street. They, they sneak out Key Bank's line going That's out to Oak okay. Street. Yep. But it, it's confusing. It's so old and whatnot. <laughs> uh, and to keep pursuing it, it's very costly. But they don't know who owns their existing, uh, you know, it's kind of, the town is saying it's Key Bank's lateral all the way as far as they can find out where it is. And then it's blocked. So they recommend Putting a new, they put it when they did uh, realign Main Street. They put a stub in Main Street, so Key Bank can go to Main Street, but they would have to put a pump system in. Okay. And then uh, they're up for RFP in January, so that's all I've got. And unless you've got any more, the Key Bank was actually I, was, I thought that was the I and I project, but no, <laughs> so Ed's Ed's better at the collections. I'm better at the plant, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Mr. Wood. Um, I really have no report. Uh, just uh, an aside there to uh, my earlier comments there. Um, just to uh, let the guys know from the Killingly PD, we appreciated them coming out for the services as well. Thank you. Mr. Cretula. Um, going through the holidays, I didn't really have any meetings to attend. I was. I was uh, happy to attend the ribbon cutting at Black Pond and present them with their plaque for, uh, from the town. And uh, I'd like to thank all the town employees at the holiday party that we didn't get to go to that, uh, for their years of service. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, I agree. Uh, it, when you see uh, town staff that have worked here as long as they have, um, they're, they're valuable assets to the town. Um, the knowledge, the experience, the they know their positions inside and out um, and it, it says a lot about the work environment here at the town hall as well um, if if it wasn't a great place to work you wouldn't see employees staying as long as quite a few of our employees have um, I did attend the Board of Ed meeting last month um, Mr. Farron had touched upon pretty much everything um, I did talk to, I did bring to them that the fiscal subcommittee of the town council is looking to meet with their fiscal subcommittee um, to discuss the possible uh, format change to the uh, Board of Ed budget when it gets presented uh, this spring. Um, and I did field questions on the uh, elevator maintenance at the Westfield Avenue project. Um, and Ms. Calorio did uh, answer a few questions as well. Um, she was there at the meeting as well, just to clarify a few things. And as Mr. Farron said, they did agree to spend money out of the non-lapsing account for that maintenance. And that's all I have. Ms. George. And I am the new BOE liaison starting tomorrow. And over the holidays, we didn't have any comments. Thank you. Ms. Barkley. 
the housing authority meeting was canceled because they didn't have a quorum the planning and zoning meeting um Oh, yeah, it was December 20th. Um, so Frito Lay's attorney um, presented um, the plans that they came up with. They modified the parking lot um, and relocated the expansion of the parking lot so that the, the trees and the berm will be left as they are. They are planning on lowering the um, light poles from 25 feet to 20 feet so there's a less of an impact on the light pollution. Um, they stated that the traffic um, study that was completed in 2018, um, there was a greater volume of traffic than observed in 2021 so the DOT says the study is sufficient and they don't need to do another one. Um, the expansion project if approved is slated to take 30 months. Um, People are uh, concerned about um, the traffic, so they said they would be averaging 65 construction workers a day, 420 construction workers on site at peak, and to help mitigate traffic congestion, carpooling and vans will be part of the sub of the subcontracts, and they also be directed to use um, 395 in Ottawa and Crossing. And if the DOT determines that any um, improvements need to be made on 395, these will be the responsibilities of the applicant. And in response to the sound complaints, um, they completed the installation of improvements between um, October and December of 2021, and the sound studies were completed and um, applicable levels um, of sound are now what they've done um, so they found that the starch recovery system was a dominant sound generator so they put silencers on the starch recovery system and during the ex the expansion will comply with noise noise standards also um, the sound will be contained within the building and sound wall will be um, constructed behind the existing plant and the, somebody questioned the number of trailers that they have so the trailers are used for storage to um, hold up to 2.4 days of product to optimize time and for their just-in-time production. The um, automated storage and retrieval system, that's um, the expansion that they're looking for the variance for. It requires a height of 86 feet 8 inches and that's for the pallet storage and that has been determined to be the optimal height for storage because they used an eight-tier system and um, they said that going up in height is less of an impact on the surrounding community as opposed to going building um, out. And there was a question on the forest management plan um, of 2010 and Frito-Lay um, thought they met the intent of the plan. Um, the railroad um, expansion eliminated some of the tree buffers and they said that they would um, landscape to cover the bare areas. So that was pretty much of the Frito-Lay. And um, the rezoning from the commercial to light industrial on 543 Warrigan Road and 19 Reach, um, Lucian Avenue um, was approved. And 17 Lucian Avenue is already light industrial. So that'll be the um, metal and welding fabrication that will occupy the 2,200 square feet of the um, building, the old Benny's. And that was it. Okay. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is 17 executive session, and we have nothing for executive session. So item 18, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. <laughs> motion has been made by Mr. Wood. I believe it was seconded by Mr. Grandelsky. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. This meeting is adjourned.